thank you everyone. Um, yes, I, I actually want to talk to, about, to you about what we have been doing for our customers, what we see in the marketplace. But before I start doing that, I think it'd be useful to talk a little bit about the technology and our company to put things in context. So let me start with that. This is a screenshot I took of our website a few days ago. So just to give you a sense of size and scope, the number you see there circle in red is the number of servers we have launched. Uh, over 20,000 users of the software, more than 600,000 servers launched at this point, both in the US and in Europe, and uh, more than 40 million server hours under management. So for us, for our customers, for the people using this, this is by no means new. We've been doing this actually for quite a few years. Let me say uh, who we are and what we do, and then I'll talk about the, the examples and the technology a little bit more. Riskill is software software that uh, companies use to manage servers that deploy in one or more of these infrastructure as a service clouds that you see there at the bottom. And notice those can be either public or private. Amazon by far being the largest, but there's also private ones like Eucalyptus. It was mentioned by Simon Worley during his presentation. Uh, and there's some that are even uh, hybrid, for example, VMware, which is not on the slide yet, but you can have your own private cloud, or there's uh, public uh, cloud companies that are powered by that technology. For us, it's APIs that we use to communicate with those clouds. What we do can be broadly classified there across the middle of the slide. Automation, lots of things related to make it easier for operations people, for sysadmins to manage their environments. Things like being able to cluster a group of servers and put some metrics on them and trigger points so they scale up and down with demand. A very, very popular feature. Something else that we do and, and where I spend most of my day is uh, that we have a library of pre-configured server templates. So when somebody wants to launch an application, say IBM's DB2 or MySQL or an Apache server, instead of having to be expert on how to configure and install everything, you literally pick it off a menu and you can launch it. And last, because we deployed hundreds of these, uh, we gained quite a bit of empirical knowledge and we develop a best practices approach. So we do a bit of consulting for our customers because of that. Um, just to draw a distinction, because people sometimes mean significantly different things when they're talking about cloud computing. Uh, you have software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Broadly, people call it cloud computing. Software as a service actually has been around for a long, long time. They just started calling it cloud computing. Things like Facebook or Gmail or even enterprise applications like Salesforce. You're running your, your application right there on the web browser. Notice the X and the Y axis here, how there's a trade-off between the automation and the portability. You have to do a lot less when you have software as a service, but you have a lot less flexibility how you can customize it perhaps. Platform as a service is things like Google App Engine or uh, Salesforce's uh, force.com, where you need to write things in a custom language they have, force, I'm, I'm sorry, called Apex. A uh, very useful environment, but uh, once you write your application logic on Apex, you cannot migrate it anywhere else. By the way, I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other, I'm just drawing a distinction about the different approaches, and, and they're, they're, they're appropriate depending on what you want to do in, in each instance. Infrastructure as a service is the same components you know and use today. Servers, storage, IP networks that tie them together, except now you can make API calls. On a, on a web browser, you can use a graphical user interface to quickly stand up servers and machines and create systems out of it. That's the area that we play in. And we provide a lot of automation to give you the benefits of some of the other approaches, but keeping complete control over everything so you can customize it as much as you want. What happens when people are architecting infrastructures now? Well, they usually have to spend a lot of capital on very inflexible assets, servers, storage, load balancers, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, things you put in a data center, and what they have in common is that they can be rather costly. So here's a good way to summarize, perhaps it's an idea you can take to other people in your organization that may not know as much or, or want to understand the details about cloud computing this could be a useful way to communicate it to them. When you put it together an IT project, you need to make a prediction about how much usage it's gonna have, and, and you're gonna buy infrastructure according to that. And it usually goes up over time. Systems are usually predicted to use more resources as the time goes by. What you see here on the blue line is the way that people actually buy equipment, in big trenches or in lumps. Therefore, that stair shape there. However, 
the actual demand in your systems is almost impossible to predict. Anybody that's been in operations will tell you this. You take a guess, but you just never know where it's gonna go. 60, Huey. All right. So what do most companies do? They weigh your over-provision capacity in order to prevent that problem, kind of like an insurance policy. And they do it to avoid this, to find yourself needing more infrastructure than you have at that moment. So this idea of virtualization infrastructure and being able to add the resources as, as you need them allows you to do something like this. And notice the curve, whoops, I guess that slide went up a little bit. So let me wrap up with, with a customer story here. Here's a customer that launched with 40 servers and it's a Facebook app that was so successful at their peak they were installing 25,000 new users per hour that were signing up. That straight line you see there is about 40 servers. During their peak, it grew to 4,700 servers. Notice the data across the bottom there. This is April of last year. So it's not new technology, something we've been doing for a long time that people are just now starting to hear about. What happens is, and we have permission from this company to share this, we do this for a lot of companies and they consider it an operational advantage over their competitors, so you don't hear a lot of people bragging about how well they're doing because they don't want other people to know yet. That's what it is, so thank you. Thank you.